Okay, so we're going to begin Parashat Emor. When one reads through the parasha, especially in the very beginning, you have the impression that the Torah is speaking only to Kohanim. And it's true. The Kohanim, the priests, who are responsible for many functions in the Bet HaMikdash, the temple, have to be very careful, have to do things in just in the right way. And if what they do is not done perfectly, then not only does it not qualify as a sacrifice, they can get into trouble, depending on it what exactly was done. So there are definitely details about their performance in this parasha. However, the lessons in parasha Temor apply to everyone. So I think it's important to focus what those lessons are. In the previous parasha, in Parashat Kedoshim, one of the highlights of the parasha was that the Torah says to us, puts an emphasis on getting along with everyone and tells us, that was, you should care about another Jew as much as you care about yourself. It says you should love, but I explained that love means to care, to treat him as an equal, to respect him, to help him, and so forth. And we explained how that one mitzvah of caring for another individual is a keresh kvitza. It's a springboard to be able to observe all the mitzvot, ben adam all the commandments that apply between one and his fellow. In other words, if we comply with this one, and we're careful in how we treat others, and we help others, and we're considerate of others, this will help us develop a better relationship with people in general. In this parasha, however, we will see a Keresh Kvitsa, a springboard on how to be able to observe all the commandments between us and God. In other words, there are certain tools, there are certain ideas that can help us develop a stronger connection with Him, so that the mitzvot that we perform on a regular basis between us and him, are done in the right manner, with excitement, with intent, not hesitating, and so forth. So we need to understand what exactly is required in order for a Jew to be steady, to be constant, to be continuously devoted, because people do cool off. It could be at once they may have done something right, they may have done something with excitement, and then they cool off. So we need to understand the dynamics. What exactly happens in a person's life? Why sometimes people let go? But instead of calling it letting go, I want to ask the question as follows. Why do people in general fail? When we talk about failing, we're talking about marriage. Sometimes marriages fail. And sometimes people fail, meaning that they may have started out doing the right thing, being kind, and just doing their job. And somehow something happened to them, and they failed. They went off the path. What exactly causes them to fail? And the, the best example that comes to mind is divorce. But what kind of a divorce? I'm not talking about people who were married for many, many years, and they just got bored of each other, or something terribly went wrong. There are times when that is the only remedy. So I'm not saying that something terrible happened and they got divorced. In other words, I'm talking about a situation where they were very, very close, they respected each other, they spent a lot on their wedding, and just after two months, and you heard of such cases, after a very short time, they decided to get divorced. What happened? And this is a question that bothered me a lot when I was at a wedding, where they spent so much, they even had pigeons that they released at the time of the chupa ceremony. Beautiful. A lot of money was spent on flowers. And they really liked each other, the chatan nekala de banigu. I'm talking about these kind of situations. What could go wrong? You know, so much was invested into the marriage, and things were working out. Things were okay in the very beginning. So what went wrong? Why should this happen that they should get divorced, especially so quickly? If you learn the parasha, you will notice that there is a section devoted to physical injury, Parashat Emor, when one brings about a mum, he causes a physical injury to another individual. He hit him. He hit him. And he injured him. So obviously he has to pay. He has to compensate that individual. And the question is, why should he hit him? Why should he be physical with another individual? It's one thing to be upset, it's one thing to say something, to criticize, but to hit? We know that hitting 
is something very, very not nice. We know that it's wrong, obviously. But how did he ever get to that point that he raised his hand against another Jew? The only way this can happen, I'm not talking about the cause, but the only way this could actually happen and lead to physical injury is when the individual who's doing the physical abuse, doing the hitting, mezalzel bashemi. He has no respect for that individual. If he lost respect for him, even if it's momentarily, he is capable of doing that. You respect someone very, very much. I don't think you will hit him. So in order to hit, to be physical with someone in, a, in an abusive way, it has to be that you have lost respect for that individual. If one would therefore be respectful of another individual, he wouldn't so easily come to that. So we're dealing up about, we're talking here about respect or lack of respect, which can definitely make a big difference in any relationship. Now in life in general, there are things that we value very much and we hold them in, in high regard. And there are things that we don't value so much and we don't care so much about them. Let's, for, for this parasha, let's separate those two and call them Kodesh and Chon. That which is holy, meaning important to us, we hold it in high regard. And then there's Chol. Chol means something which is not holy, not holy, unholy, not so special. We may have something to do with it, we may care a little bit about it, but not as much. So in life, in general, we do have things like that. Some things we hold in high regard, <coughs> some things we hold in high regard, and some things not so much. So what's the question here? The question here is, how does it ever happen that something that once upon a time was Kodesh become Chol? Something that was holy, that we did hold in high regard, how does that all of a sudden turn to Chol? Either it's Kodesh or it's Chol. But for something to be holy in the very beginning, special, we care so much about it, and then it becomes whole. It's a puzzle. How does that happen? So I thought about three explanations of how this could happen. Either we don't know how holy it is, ignorance. We don't realize the importance of it. That's number one. Number two, it's very possible that the individual who is mistreating a particular holy item or mistreating another human being, he himself has some psychological problem, he has some characteristic flaw in him that as a result of this flaw in his character, in his personality, he does not respect enough another individual who deserves to be respected. This happens a lot. In psychology, there's something called projection, which the rabbis speak about. The rabbis tell us, Kol posel posel. If somebody calls someone a name, you are lazy, you are this, you are that, a real nasty name, he himself possibly has that character flaw. Projection, it's called in psychology. Many times, subconsciously, we don't realize that. It may come out like that, that somebody accuses someone or says something to someone in a disrespectful way because he has some character flaw. So I'm using the example of projection to apply here because that's what projection is all about, a character flaw that we see in others where in reality we may have it ourselves. So here it's not necessarily projection of the same flaw, but it is a flaw. And as a result of that character flaw, sometimes people tend to minimize a favor that was done to them. A favor. He was kind to you. Then why don't you say thank you? Why don't you appreciate it? And worse, sometimes people not only minimize it or ignore it, they actually speak bad about the person who helped them out. Character flaw very possibly can explain something like that. Number three, if from the very beginning, all along, for many years, they were always used to making fun and belittling that which is Kodesh. That which was holy in their mind, they always made fun of. They always didn't think highly of it. So it could be they just got used to making fun of certain things that they didn't realize are holy to begin with. So you see in this parasha, 
as a result of the many possibilities that things can go wrong and people not being careful with each other, in this case with Avodat HaKodesh, with the service of Hashem, the Kohanim are warned to be careful. Be careful that you don't make any mistakes. Be careful not to minimize the work. If you recall, we spoke about the garments, they had to be dressed in a certain way, they had to wear those clothing at the time of the work. They had to be reminded of how important their job is. So they had to have this uniform, if we can call it that. And that uniform, those clothing, were holy, were impressive, especially the Kohen Gadol, in order to remind that individual and to remind us that this is le kavodu le tiferet, this is something special, this is something honorable, respect it, be careful with it, make sure you wear it when you do the, the work. So we are already used to the Torah telling us, look, the big day kehuna, the garments are holy, the location, the Bet HaMidash, the Mishkan, is holy. Be careful when you enter, how you enter, what you do there. So that we are already used to by now. We realize that that place, that location, that work that the Kohanim are doing is very important. Here in this parasha, the Torah now introduces the Hakrava itself. The animal cannot be with a blemish. The Kohen cannot have a physical blemish. Hashem says, listen, I feel bad for the Kohen who's missing an arm. Okay, fine, but he can't do every job. This is not proper. You know, send someone who is complete. Take this seriously. Don't take this shortcut. Don't take the cheap way out. Do it 100%. So the Kohen cannot have a physical blemish. The animal cannot have a physical blemish. Otherwise, people eventually will say, let's just get something cheap for a Korban. Let's just have somebody do it. Anyone. We want to give it the utmost respect. We want to remember that this is holy. We want to do it with perfection. And we want to be careful that we don't make any mistakes. So in order to impress upon us the importance of the sacrifices, that this is not just an animal, this is something very, very important. Therefore, it has to be done with tremendous amount of caution. But it's not just caution, it's with perfection. Perfection applying to both the Kohen and to the animal. So, in talking about physical blemishes, we are familiar with what the Torah lists, or what the Torah considers as a physical blemish, whether it's on the Kohen or on the animal. But that's just one kind of blemish, the physical blemish. Obviously, this makes sense to us. It has a blemish. It's no good. It's not perfect. But there's another kind of blemish called Tum'ah, a spiritual type of blemish, Ruhani. Zemum Ruhani, it's a blemish, but it's spiritual in nature. You don't see the blemish, but there's some Tum'ah, some impurity involved, either in the Kohen or the animal, also no good. It can't be impure. Otherwise, the job is not complete, the job is not right. Then there's one more, one more blemish that a lot of people don't realize, but it's also very, very significant. And that is in the Itnagut in the behavior, in the comportment, in the kavanah of the Kohen. What is the Kohen thinking at the time he's bringing the Korban? Does he have the right thoughts, the wrong thoughts? Does he know what he's doing? Does he really care about what he's doing? All that kavanah can make a difference whether the Korban will be accepted by Hashem or not, whether it will achieve atonement or not, depending on the Korban and the sacrifice. So this, I consider another type of blemish that will disqualify the Qurban if it's not done right, if it's in his itna, good or kavana, in his behavior or in his intent. What was he thinking at the time that he was bringing this Qurban? What can go wrong? Well, he could be thinking about other things. Imagine somebody praying, all right? And during a prayer, he's thinking about Hong Kong, his business there. Is that praying? He's thinking about his business at the time he's praying. It's not right. No kavanah. Therefore, the words that are being said are not real. They're fake. They're being said as a result of a routine. He has a routine. He talks. But does he really mean those words, those praises, those words of praise, the words of thanks, the requests he's making to Hashem? He's not using those moments, those special moments of prayer to communicate to Hashem properly. So that's the way it works with sacrifices or any avodat kodesh, that which is holy, 
is that sometimes it could be that the Kohen will not have the right thoughts. And I said could be, but in reality it actually happened that during the Temple era, during the time we had the first temple and the second temple to an extent as well, the Kohanim did not always do their job right. And they were rebuked, they were told off by the prophets, what are you doing? Would you bring this to your prince? Would you bring this as a gift to your prince? You picked it up in the 99 cent store. <laughs> this is what you're going to bring to your prince? Aren't you ashamed of yourself? How could you be so cheap? How could you not pay attention to detail? How could you not care about it? So we find that the Kohanim are being rebuked for exactly this point. That there was no heart, there was no kavanah. There's a lot of fake in this world. We all know about fake. A good example of what is fake is imagine you get a gift. And the gift is wrapped in a beautiful wrapper. Beautiful, beautiful wrapper. The box is big, but inside there is something insignificant. So the wrapper was nicer than what the gift really was. But why did they wrap it to begin with? To impress you. That's what a lot of people try to do. They try to impress you with something which is external. Chitzoni. But it's fake. It's external. It's physical. Emposhun tochen. There's no content. The gift is worthless. Another example that I like sometimes to point out is, have you ever seen commercials? I mean, we don't see TV these days, right? But sometimes you come across a billboard or somehow you, you, you receive the flyer where you see a picture of a movie star holding a shampoo. Oh, that shampoo must be good if the movie star is holding it or using it. They hired him, they're paying him a lot of money because they know people will say, oh, he uses it, I'm going to use it too. It must be good. Who told you it's good? <laughs> Just because he held it. But they know. That's why in advertisements so much money is being spent to mislead. Not always, of course, are they misleading people. Sometimes they may have a good product. But it's not necessarily a great product as they claim it might be just because the, the one who presents it is a movie star. That's misleading. You have to try it out, you have to see what other people say, then you will know if this is worth your money or not. But that's what happens in real life, is that there's a lot of fake. People misrepresent all kinds of things to try to impress you. So what exactly is missing? Why do people do that? In the Kabbalah it is more elaborated, but we actually can see it in this week's parasha as well, that the Torah is telling us the goal, the goal is when you were involved in Avodata Kodesh, in the service of Hashem, that which is holy, is make sure that the Sechel and the Lev are connected, that the intellect and the heart are both connected, they're in sync. A lot of times people use their intellect. They understand what they're doing, there's logic involved, they're aware, but there's no heart. No excitement, no emotion, they're not really into it. Sometimes people have the heart, you know, they do it, they're happy to do it, but there's no intellect, meaning that they don't have the real kavana. They, they don't know why they have to do it. They don't understand what they're doing. The sechel is not there, the intellect is not there. There's a need to connect sechel and lev, intellect and heart, that they should be in sync, that a person should be aware of what he's doing, he should mean it, in other words, have the intent to do it, do it, of course, happily, without any complaint, not feeling that it's a burden, not doing it because it's a routine, because it's some custom, but no, but actually looking forward to do it because it's something special. That is the connection of intellect with heart. So sometimes that doesn't happen. When that's not there, we consider the job half done. Lo shalem, because it's not both, the intellect and the heart. So there's a lot of things like that in life, including human relationships, that they're not complete. There's something there, they have something in common, they share certain values, of course, but it's not complete. Something is missing. Now, it could be a lot is missing. You know, we're talking, of course, about respect, and we're talking about uh, values. There's a lot of things that go into building a, a relationship, an enduring relationship. But here we're dealing with a, a problem that I started talking about, and that is, how come it started off on the right foot and then it just dissipated?
perhaps there was something incomplete in the very beginning that they didn't notice. They themselves were not aware of it, but something was missing. And we'll talk a little bit more about it towards the end, what exactly was missing. But I already gave you a little bit of an idea with this concept of connecting the heart with the intellect. To know was to be completely immersed in it, that the mind has to be there and the heart has to be there, not just one without the other. So this helps us understand that sometimes, whether it's in a relationship with another human being, in marriage, or in a relationship with Hashem, many, many times people are not doing things in sync, in other words, their heart with their mind. And therefore, it's incomplete. So how do we get the two in sync? What needs to be done to connect the sechel and the lev? There's a very unique word in this parasha, and earlier as well, in Sefer Vayikra, that a lot of people when they study about the korbanot, they don't really fully understand what it means. And that is the word lirtsono or lirtsonchem. Lirtsono or lirtsonchem, which literally means to your will. What do you mean to your will? That make sure you bring the sacrifice or whatever it is that you do, that it should be lirtsono, lirtsonchem. For you, for him, depending if it's an individual, depending if it's a lot of people, what does it mean, that it should be acceptable? The simple meaning is that this should be acceptable. Make sure that you do it right, that it should be acceptable, which means that Hashem should approve of it, Hashem should welcome it, and, of course, that this sacrifice should succeed in doing whatever it was meant to do. So, ultimately, the simple meaning of the word, in this case, implies, make sure you do it right. Make sure you do it in a complete way, so it should be Lirzon Chem, that it should be acceptable to Hashem. It, was, it should be acceptable for us, in other words, it should work in our favor, which means that Hashem should be happy with it. Okay. But that's just a simple meaning. The deeper meaning of Lirzon Chem is as follows. A lot of times people do something because they are told to do it. They don't feel like doing it necessarily. They will not necessarily do it on their own. Lirzon Chem comes to teach us that you know, you, you know what is really expected of us. If your heart and mind would be in sync, hopefully you will want to do it on your own. A child needs to be told by his father, do this, do that. How do we know the child matured? We're talking about something good, of course, something positive. The child doesn't have to be told anymore. He understands on his own, and he does it on his own, and he does it gladly, not because he's afraid, right? He does it gladly. He understands the value. He's like, like a father himself. He's like an adult himself. He understands, oh, now I know why this is so important. You know, as children who are not mature, they don't always understand why the father asks of them to do something. They think the father may be wrong. You know, today, teenagers think they know better than their parents. It's a big problem. Now, they may know about computers more than their parents. Yes, but it's impossible for them to really know the truths about life better than their parents necessarily, unless we're talking about religious law, which is, could, which is a possibility that the child learned in school, picked it up, and, and the parent does not know. So I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, in general, wisdom. <clears throat> that one acquires as a result of maturing and having it experienced. No comparison, a child to an older person. But the child thinks he knows. When he grows up, he realizes it on his own, and hopefully he adopts th those ways that his father tried to, to train him early on. So here, Lirzon Chem is telling us that hopefully you will reach this point that when you do something for Hashem, you will do it on your own without having to be told and commanded and, and pushed to do so, that you will gladly understand the importance of it. That's one idea behind it. Also, Lirzon Chem also means that you should really want to do it. Really want to do means not that you understand the importance of it, that you really want to. You are happy to do so. Lirzon Chem, you should have the desire to want to do it. This is a little bit different than what I just said before. To do it on your own. Here, it's not just to do it on your own, but to actually want to. I'll give you an example, maybe with tzedakah or any mitzvah. 
There are people that just give tzedakah when people ask of them. They feel bad. The poor man asks them for help, and they help him. Baruch Hashem. Thank God at least that they're kind and sensitive, and that they help out this poor man. They're for, for sure fulfilling the mitzvah of tzedakah. But you know that a higher level of tzedakah would be to go search for people who need the tzedakah. To ask him, is there anything I can do for you? Do you need any help this month? Not waiting for the man, for the poor man to ask, but to actually look for the opportunity because they want to perform the mitzvah. Big difference between the two. Different levels of tzedakah. There are various levels. If you look into, in, into the Shulchan Aruch, in Ilchot, the Alachot of tzedakah, you will find various levels of tzedakah. Giving it anonymously is another level because in this way you're not taking credit. A lot of times people love to give charity because they want people to know that they gave. So anonymously is another level of tzedakah where you don't seek your honor. Sometimes you don't want to give anonymously because you may get the reputation of being stingy. Nobody ever saw you giving tzedakah. There are stories like that of people who everybody in the community thought they were stingy because they never saw them giving tzedakah. All the tzedakah was given anonymously. So there are times to be anonymous, but there are times where people have to learn from you. It's not just the impression that you, you don't give. If you give, they will learn to give as well. So charity happens in different ways depending on the individual. There are some people who are doing it because they're compassionate, they feel bad, and some, they're not necessarily compassionate, but that is the mitzvah. Hashem commanded me to give. Okay, regardless, at least he does it. But here we're talking about the higher level. Not because of compassion, not because the Torah commands us, because I want to. I want to on my own. I know it's a mitzvah, but I'm motivated to do it because I know this is the right thing to do. I don't wait for the poor man to arouse my sensitivity, to tell me his story. No, I'm looking for that. So this shows a much higher level of, of devotion to a mitzvah. When we say Lirzon Chem, it's also reminding us that the mitzvah that we do, the Avodat HaKodesh, the service of Hashem, is in the end letovatim. It's for our benefit. When a Jew performs a mitzvah, it's good if he keeps in mind, I'm not doing anyone a favor over here. This is actually for my benefit. When people come and ask me for tzedakah, a lot of them are embarrassed. A lot of them used to be wealthy in the past and lost all their money, and each one with a story. For all kinds of reasons they need help. And they feel bad that they have to come unto people and knock on their door. So you know what I tell them? I, I realize this. I realize this already for many, many years of, of, of receiving people like that at my door. And one of the things I immediately tell them, especially if I sense that this man or woman is really ashamed of what they're doing, is you're doing me a favor much more than I'm doing you. You know that I'm going to give you something, but I'm sure you need a lot more. So, obviously, this is nice, it's, it's a tzedakah, but you should know, you came here to help me, because I need that merit of that tzedakah. You're helping me, and I encourage you to go to as many doors and people as you can to give them that opportunity to fulfill the mitzvah tzedakah. You think you're here for yourself? You're here to help us. You're here to make sure that as many Jews as possible fulfill this mitzvah. So you can't just sit at home, like, like many of them would prefer, that the money should come to them. No, Hashem said, buy yourself a ticket, take a flight, come to America, or whatever it is, and make it so that people have the opportunity to fulfill this beautiful mitzvah that Hashem wants to see more and more, where Jews help each other. Where there's a lot of chesed and kindness. If you wouldn't come, where would the chesed be? Where would this mitzvah take place? So you are bringing this about. You know what kind of a mission you have here? You have a very special mission. And by the way, be thankful to Boeing that you got here in 15 hours, the airplane from Israel. Had you traveled 200 years ago by boat, it would have taken you several weeks and you would have been seasick. <laughs> so I make them laugh too. <laughs> Not only do I make them feel good, make them laugh and offer them a little, a little drink. Maybe they're thirsty and they're embarrassed to ask. So you've got to be sensitive to their situation, put yourself in their shoes and realize that you wouldn't want to be in that situation. You're being tested at that moment. And hopefully you will pass the test 
with flying colors. But we must realize that in order to, to do the mitzvah 100%, 100%, we have to want to do it. That, oh no, he's coming now, knocking on my door, dinner time, I'm tired. It's a big test. We're tested all the time, sometimes in the most difficult moments, just to see how much we really care about a mitzvah. A mitzvah is not going to come at the easiest time when you have lots of money and when you're comfortable and when you're quiet and not eating and not busy. It may come at a difficult time. So be prepared because all of these are tests. So we must realize that every opportunity to perform mitzvah in the end is for our benefit. That's also behind the words lirtzong chem. This is for you, ratzong. This is for you, for your benefit. So. The, all of this is only possible if we hold that which is holy in high regard, if we're careful with it. If people are not careful with that which is holy, people do not care about it or are not aware of it, then it's not going to happen easily. It can only happen, what I just explained to you, that something is done in the right manner, if people are always careful with that which is Kodesh. Because they're careful, then they will make sure that what is done, is done in the right way. So therefore, because we need to be careful with that which is called, the Torah tells us it's not enough that a certain object is holy. You have to make it holy too. You have to sanctify it. Shabbat, for example, is holy. Hashem made it holy, the seventh day of the week. It's holy. Even if you don't do anything, it's holy. But Hashem says, no, it's not enough that something is holy. You have to be mekadesh the Shabbat. You have to sanctify it. You have to abstain from certain work. You have to make the Kiddush. You have to treat it in a certain way. So it's not enough that we are told that something is Kodesh. In order for that which is holy to really, really be held in high regard for many, many years to come, we always have to do ma'asim. We have to actually perform certain deeds to sanctify it. So the Kohanim would be doing things continuously, going into the mikveh, dipping, in, in the, that ritual bath, changing clothes, being careful with what they're doing. It's not enough that they're told this is holy. No, you got to do holy things, holy actions, in order to preserve the importance of that which is holy in your eyes. Otherwise, very easily, with time, a person may come to minimize it if he doesn't treat it in a, in a special way. So it's not enough that we're told it's holy, we actually have to continuously do things to sanctify it, to remind us that this is something very, very special. So since we're talking about doing ma'asim, doing things to remind us of the sanctity of something, of the importance of something, what's the most important ma'asim of all? What can we do? Something that applies just about to any mitzvah, including the learning of Torah. What ma'asim can we do? What act can we do? that will help us maintain the interest in that mitzvah forever. Doing something L'Shem Shammai. That act is doing something for the sake of heaven. In other words, not for your own self-interest, for your own gain. What's for your gain? You might say, wow, I have a great opportunity to build my bank account in heaven, in Shammai. I'm going to do this mitzvah. Yes, it's true. We are going to be rewarded for what we do in Olam Abba in the world to come. True. But that's not 100% Hashem Shammai. That's not for the sake of heaven. To do something because Hashem asked of me. To do it because Hashem expects the Jewish people to perform certain mitzvot. And we have therefore a responsibility to do it. That's all more or less Hashem Shammai. Doing it for the real reason. Not everybody does things for the real reason. They may help someone because they want eventually a favor from them. Right? They're not necessarily helping someone because this is a mitzvah. They feel bad for him. There was a story, I may have told you once, of a rabbi who had somebody knock on his door. A poor man knocked on his door. And he asked him for some tzedakah, and he gave him. After the poor man left, the rabbi ran after him. He says, here, I want to give you some more. Why do you want to give me some more tzedakah now? The first time I gave you is because I had pity on you. I saw how you were dressed, your shoes were torn, I felt bad for you. Now I want to do the mitzvah of tzedakah. I want to give you, not because I have pity, because Hashem asked me to give you. 
You see, this is Hashem Shamayim for the sake of the mitzvah, for doing it for the real reason. So many times, unfortunately, people do things because there's some personal gain, some interest involved. And that's what happens between nations. Nations have interests. They do certain things because of some interest. Not because that is the right thing necessarily to do. There's some interest involved. When it comes to the mitzvot, that's the goal. The goal is to do things Hashem Shemaim. And I call it the goal because no one begins to do mitzvot the Shem Shemaim. It takes years until we develop that mindset where the heart and mind are in sync that we can focus on doing the mitzvah for the real reason. That doesn't happen overnight. Even with great rabbis who are very learned, knowledgeable, and are careful with mitzvot, to do something the Shem Shemaim is a higher level in the performance of a mitzvah. But that is the most important one, in a sense. The most important ma'asir that we can do to sanctify something, to sanctify a mitzvah, for example, is to do that mitzvah, the Shem Shemaim. That's the highest level of mitzvah. Now, what's wrong if a mitzvah is done shelo le Shem Shemaim? You still perform the mitzvah. You still get some credit for it. The problem is, that any time a mitzvah is done shelo l'shem shamayim, not for the real reasons, or it's lacking in the l'shem shamayim, I call it in Hebrew midron chalaklak. You understand what that means? A slippery slope. It means that because it's lacking, it could be that one day he'll stop doing it. Altogether. It's a slippery slope. If something is not l'shem shamayim, it's not complete, then it may never be done. It may never be done 100% in the right way. And as a result of that, the person who has been doing it may lose his resolve, may lose his interest in doing it one day for whatever reason. Pressures, yeah. A lot of people have all kinds of pressures. Imagine somebody hasn't earned a penny for six months, and now somebody offers him a bribe or offers him money, but he needs to do something against the Torah in order to get that money. He may be tempted. It all depends on how much devotion he used to have towards that mitzvah in the past. The more devoted he was, you think he'll let go of it so easily? Even if you give him a million dollars, not so easily. But somebody whose devotion was never there to begin with, never did it to Shem Shemayim, he might say, okay, just this time, just this time. You know those people who want to go on a diet? And all of a sudden, they are at a wedding, and they see cakes they never saw in their life. Okay, the diet is starting tomorrow, <laughs> not now. You see what I mean? So that's what happens. When a mitzvah is not 100% Hashem Shemayim, it's a slippery slope. He may lose that interest that he may have had once. The only exception to not the Shem Shemayim is Torah. Rabbi Sturz, you can learn Torah, Shalom L'Shem Shemayim. Learn it to be knowledgeable. Not necessarily because Hashem wants us to learn or to perform the mitzvah of learning Torah. You're curious. It's okay. Because just get started. Torah is so important for the Jew. This is what gives us the strength to do battle with the Yetzirah. If we don't get started, even though it may not be for the real reason, then we'll never get ahead. Hashem, therefore, wants us to learn Torah even if it's not for the real reasons. Eventually, we will learn it for the real reasons. Because if we start learning Torah, and we see how beautiful it is, hopefully we will absorb a tremendous amount of Yerat Shammai, fear of heaven as a result of learning Torah. Little by little, we will become stronger, and eventually, we will be able to learn Lishma, L'Shem Shammai, for its real sake. But you don't want to always stay Shelo Lishma. You don't always want to just learn Torah for curiosity, you want to learn it for the real reasons. Because Torah Lishma, Torah Lishem Shamayim, is much more powerful. The effect that it has on the Neshama, the soul, is much more powerful than Torah Shelo Lishma. The protection that it offers, the schut, it's tremendous. There's a lot to be gained from learning Torah Lishma, Torah Lishem Shamayim. So the same is true with any mitzvah. Even though people may start off not doing it for its real purpose, at the very least, they should aspire to one day do it 100% properly. 
that having that aspiration, that goal, can help a lot. People who don't care so much, who are not really devoted to a mitzvah, they run the risk of one day losing interest. All right, so how do we get to L'Shem Shammai? How do we get to that higher level where we do things for the sake of heaven? What's required in order to get there is Kedusha, holiness. One who's not holy, one who's immersed in all kinds of things that are not proper, will have a tremendous struggle with any mitzvah, because a mitzvah is something of holiness. It's the instruction of Hashem. Something which is unholy poses a threat. It will be a big struggle. You cannot be involved in things that are unholy and expect to be holy. It's impossible. So, L'Shem Shamaim is a very high level. It's a high level of holiness in a sense. So therefore, in order to be able to grow spiritually and get to that level where you are excited about it, you're completely devoted to it, you have a lot of interest in doing it on your own, all of that requires Kedusha, holiness. <clears throat> but it's not just holiness, it's Taharat HaMachshava. One's thoughts have to be pure. A person who doesn't have pure thoughts is also going to have a very, very hard time. And he will struggle in performing the mitzvah in the proper way. He may do it halfway, yes, but 100% with excitement, devotion, no. Kedusha and Taharat HaMachshava, holiness and purity of thought. Now, an individual like that who is involved in holy tasks has the purity of the mind, obviously observes the mitzvot, and is connected to the Torah because he learns the Torah on a regular basis, hopefully what will happen will be as follows. This individual will be so refined, so refined, not only in character, but in his devotion to the mitzvot, that he will never look for kulot. Kulot is leniencies. There are people whose attitude is, Rabbi, please be a little lenient with me. That's strict. The halakha sometimes has room for leniency, depending on the situation. But sometimes there's no room for leniency. You have to be strict. There are people who always look for leniencies. Kulot, leaken, lo lachmir, not to be strict. One who has been holy, connected to the Torah, observing the mitzvot, is completely in sync with what the Torah teaches, aspires to grow, he will not look for leniencies. He wants to do things the 100%. Leniencies are shortcuts. Looking for ways to do it in the minimal way. Yeah. I've heard many, many times, you know, whether it was the size of the mezuzah, what's the smallest I can get? Or the trog, what's the cheapest the trog that will be kasher? Why, why ask me that kind of a question? The cheapest a trog? The smallest mezuzah? Tzitzit? You know, the cheapest? Why not the best? Why not the most expensive? You will have some people say, I want the best. Not because they want to show off. There are some people who want to show off, but because they really want to spend money on the mitzvah. Give me the best the trog that I can afford, of course. The best one that has no blemish, that is perfect, beautiful, right size, not too small. You have some people who will say, nah, it's just for seven, eight days. Who needs the most expensive one? You know? And instead they spend their money on going to, on a cruise to Bahamas, as an example. Wait a minute, for that you do want to spend money and not for the how do you explain that? You see the difference in levels between people? It all depends how much kedusha they have, how much tahara they have, how much focus, kavana. It depends on a lot of things. People who don't aspire to grow and to be better people, then obviously they're going to look for the easy way out, and this includes marriage. But marriage requires hard work. Whoever told you it's going to be easy? Do you value it? Do you want to build a beautiful home together with your wife and have a family? Do you realize what this means? that people will see you and your wife as a model for them to follow? 
you realize the responsibility of marriage? People don't think about these things when they're young. They're all excited, marriage, going on a honeymoon. That's all they think about. They don't realize the responsibilities involved. But marriage is also something that we need to grow in, develop, improve, build upon. And of course, Hashem helps. I say Hashem help because men and women are very, very different. So there's a lot of issues that are going to come up. But if you have the right focus and you want the same things, you want to succeed, you don't want to fail, then hopefully, if you're motivated enough, you will succeed with the help of Hashem. So therefore, purity of the mind, holiness, will eventually lead the Jew to be so devoted and show interest in the Mitzvah that he's not going to look for leniencies. Okay. All of this is very, very nice. It makes some sense. But where do we take the Ratzon? There has to be a will to want these things. You know, I'm already assuming that everybody would want this. But you'd be surprised. Some people are not even interested in ever getting there. So where do we take the Ratzon, the will to want something like that, to grow spiritually? This is going to come as a surprise to you. There is very little we can do to have the ratzon. The initial ratzon either is there or not. Unless somebody is very, very convinced of it, and we call him a Baal Teshuvah, where he makes a U-turn in life and decides to embrace Torah and Mitzvot in a very, very special way, the devoted way. Yes, but that, he's not the average person. The Baal Teshuvah, one who has done Teshuvah, in other words, that he's come around and mended his ways changed his ways completely, and jumped into it. There are people like that, but we're not talking about them because that's something very, very unique, okay? That's something that the person went through some experience perhaps, or after tremendous amount of investigation and research, he reached a certain conclusion, and he's willing to do whatever it takes. Even so, it's gonna be gradual, it's gonna do, it's gonna take a lot of work for him. And eventually, hopefully, he'll get there because even him, it's a slippery slope. He may go up and he may fall down, God forbid, if he doesn't have the proper guidance and determination. But let's talk about the average individual. He's observant already, but he could be even better. He could be a stronger individual in many, many ways, more charitable, kinder, better husband and father. We're talking about a person who's already observant, okay? How does he ever get the will to want to be better? Where will he take the Ratzon to want to grow? From his parents. If the parents who brought him into this world did not have pure thoughts during the time that the father and mother were together, it's going to be tough because the Neshama, the soul that's coming down to this world, may not be completely a pure soul. It depends on what their parents' thoughts were. What kind of parents did he have? That can determine how much of a struggle he will have to be a better person or not. He may be impressed by it. He may see others and say, oh, I'm interested. But will he really be motivated? It, a lot will depend on his parents. Did the parents have some zechut, some merit? And how did they conduct themselves, especially when they brought this soul into this world? The example set by the parents is also important. I'm going to share with you a story or two that will prove this point. During the Holocaust, there was a bunch of girls, girls that were put to work. They realized Yom Kippur was approaching. And the German who was in charge of them told them, I need this pit dug tomorrow. This is girls, they don't have so much strength. But she says, you, got, you girls are gonna dig this bit tomorrow, you better finish it. And they realized it was Yom Kippur tomorrow. And they said, no matter what happens, we're gonna fast. So they told the one in charge, the German, all right, we'll do it, but we're gonna fast. And of course, that, that German was very, very upset because normally, a person who fasts does not have the strength to do that kind of work. He says, whoever does not finish the job will be shot. In other words, you want to fast? Fine, I'll let you fast. But if you don't finish the job, if the job is not complete by sundown, you will be shot. 
They didn't care. They worked, worked, worked. They fasted over 24 hours, and they completed the job. Wow. What for? Why should they fast in one of the concentration camps in those kind of circumstances? What did they learn that from? Or here's another story also with girls. Young girls who found out that the Gestapo, the men, were going to visit them. You know what I mean by that, right? The Gestapo men were going to visit them. And they were told by their, I guess, uh, the woman who was in charge of them, another Jewish woman, who was in charge of that, be prepared that this is what is coming, this is the way they're going to mistreat you and defile your holiness. So what should we do? So they thought about it and they all came to the same conclusion. They're going to drink some poison, and give their life, but not allow the Germans to defile them. In this week's parasha, we see that statement too, that the Bat Kohen, the daughter of a priest, needs to be extra careful. She's the daughter of a priest. She's desecrating her father. You know, was for her to commit a certain sin, in some ways is more serious than just any other girl. She's the daughter of a Kohen. These girls realize we're the daughters of Hashem. We're not going to let them be mechalel us. In other words, defile us. And they drank the poison, gave their life, and of course the Germans couldn't do anything about it. So the question is, where did they take the courage from? Where did they learn this from? From their parents. They saw parents who did not give in, who were not flexible about halacha, about mitzvot, who were looking for the easy way out, for leniencies. If they saw, if a child sees parents, shalom evatrim, shalom mitpashrim, that do not compromise, do not give in, then the child hopefully will inherit some of that determination and courage in times of need. Otherwise, where did they learn this from? Where did they pick it up? It was in their soul, and they saw it by example. And that is how they were able to give their lives when called upon. Unfortunately, we see the opposite in this week's parasha too. What's the opposite? At the end of the parasha, you have an individual who curses, Mekalel, using the name of God. Terrible offense, terrible, serious sin. How did he come to sin? How did he come to curse? Where did that come from? Guess what? From his mother. His mother, whose name is mentioned in the Torah for a good reason. Why is it mentioned? Because obviously she was doing something not proper when they were in Egypt. As a result of her lack of modesty, she flirted with an Egyptian. She became pregnant from that Egyptian. As a result of her lack of tzni'ut, of modesty, she talked a lot. She got into trouble. The Egyptian took advantage. He saw, oh, here's a woman that will do anything I tell her to do. Easy. So this child was born in an unholy way from a mother who was not careful in her modesty. So you see how from zilzul, from lack of respect for Kedusha, comes mekalel. Misha mezalzel yachol avol lekalel. Whoever is mezalzel, he belittles. He's disrespectful, he's not careful with that which is holy. In the end, he's capable of cursing too. Where did this begin? With the mother. How? This is the child that she brought into the world. Hello to everybody. Yeah. What? Yeah. yeah. Hello to everybody. Sure. You have in the Gemara an incident where little children, Kohanim, were eating from the Lechem Apanim, from that special bread that they would get a small portion. Not everyone would get a big portion because there was only so much of it. Once a week. So the Kohanim, or the children, the little children who had a little bit of that bread, were talking amongst each other. How much did you get? How big of a bread? One of them said, my, my bread was the size kizanav haleta'ah, like the tail of a lizard. There was somebody who overheard that child and says, uh-oh, I suspect there's something wrong in that family. For a child to describe that which is holy, lechem apanim, like the tail of a lizard, which is an unclean animal, 
something is wrong there. And they found that something was not right in that family. Something was not proper in that family. How do we know that? From the way the child expressed. He described something which is holy in a non-holy way. That tells you something. Just from the way a child talks. He may have overheard his parents talking a certain way. In this case, it was not necessarily what he overheard, but some conduct, perhaps, that was in that home that carried itself into this child for him to express about that which is holy in an unholy way. Anyway, just to conclude, we see that Zehirutim Kedusha, being cautious with that which is holy, that is the Keresh Pitsa. That is the springboard to be able to form a stronger bond with Hashem. In the same way that the Aftali Rafa Adam himself, caring for another human being, helps us with all the misfort, hopefully you will not steal from him, you will not lie to him, you will not cheat him, because you care about him. That is a springboard for those mitzvot. Being careful with that which is holy is a springboard to be able to perform all the mitzvot in Adam Lama Komitinos in Hashem property. And that is how we are able to fulfill the Nikdash Ti Betoch to sanctify Hashem's name amongst us. Today we don't have sacrifices. So what do we do? We have the tefillah, we have prayer instead of a sacrifice in a sense. So what does that mean? Just like we're careful with Kedusha, we need to be careful with our prayer, not to rush through it, to have the proper kavanah, to make sure that we pray as much as possible with the minyan, 10 people, to answer amen on time, to pray on time, not to talk in the middle of the prayer or in the time when the Torah is being read, not to show any disrespect for it. Otherwise, we lose touch with that which is holy. Yeah, people talk when they're not supposed to talk. Then they have lost their respect for that holy cause, for that holy event, for that mitzvah. Yeah. Same thing with the mouth, being careful with what we say, how we talk to others, not to curse, not to use foul language. That is why tzaddikim have, have so much power with their blessing and with their prayers, because they're careful with their mouth. They sanctify their mouth. So the mouth has power to bless, and it has power that in their prayer to Hashem, their prayers are well received. So what's the answer to our original question of why people fail? I guess the short answer is they have mixed up holiness with unholiness. Kodesh Vechol. You want to see an example of mixing up? Have you ever seen somebody wash his car on a Sunday and shine the wheels, the rim, take care of his garden? That to him is holy. Look how much time he spends on that, how he shines those rims. That for him is holy, he cares about it. But when it comes to doing a mitzvah, to helping a neighbor, or to observing anything which is important, he may not care about it as much. He has a, a complete mix-up in his priorities, a mixture, a mix-up between that which is holy and that which is unholy. So that's what happens in life. People mix up what is really important that should be held in high regard with that which doesn't deserve that much of our attention. So therefore, marriage is holy. Marriage is definitely holy. We say, the man tells the wife, you are sanctified to me. So therefore, because it is holy, it needs, people have to be more careful with it. Since people are not careful with that which is holy, they may eventually lose interest in it. If they mistreat it in the very beginning, they're not careful with it, they're going to lose complete res they're going to lose total, total respect for it. They're not going to care about it. They're going to think it's, it's like paper plates, disposable. I'll get somebody else. Marriage is holy. We need to treat it with a tremendous amount of caution. So therefore, in marriage too, we can apply the same rule we said before. The mind and the heart have to be in sync. And how are they going to be ever, how are they ever going to be in sync? When we look at marriage as we want to succeed in giving pleasure to Hashem, that Hashem should be proud of us, that He should look at us and be proud of us, whether as a, as a couple or as individuals. It requires for one to work on his character. Character refinement is a must. Other people who are stuck with their flaws of stubbornness, stinginess, or being mad and angry too often, that causes problems too. Even in an in a otherwise good relationship, people have character flaws that destroy the relationship. So the heart and mind have to be in sync. We want to succeed. We want Hashem to be proud of us. We want Him to be happy. We want to do the right thing. Heart and mind have to be in sync. We have to both want it. We have to both 
feel it and do what it takes. And that's, that leads us to the important mitzvah of this week's parasha of Sefirat Omer, which we're doing now. Counting the Omer. Very interesting mitzvah. The Torah tells us count the Omer. During the time of the Omer, count for seven weeks. Until when? Until Chag HaShavuot, the time of receiving the Torah. What's this counting all about? Make a blessing and count day by day. It's about gradual growth. Gradual growth, spiritual growth. We want to attain the highest level possible, the level where we receive the Torah, where the Torah really becomes a part of us, where we want it to be a part of us, not because we're obligated. That takes time. Day by day, the counting shows that we look forward to it. It shows that we want it. And it reminds us that it's gradual. There's no shortcuts. Step by step, we count day by day until we reach the highest levels where we're able to acquire the Torah and make that a part of our life. So for that, we need to be focused. The counting enables us to stay focused on the Tachlit, the ultimate purpose, and that is Kabbalat Torah. And last but not least, the most important tool that will help us in developing that strong relationship with Hashem, even though we talked about the various requirements that are necessary, but the most, one of the most important tools, let us not forget, is that we be respectful of another human being. Because it's not possible to be respectful of Hashem, but not to be respectful of human beings. First, work on your relationship amongst yourself, between yourself and other human beings. Learn to be respectful of another human being. Once that is under control, it will definitely be easier to develop a stronger relationship and be respectful of those mitzvot bin Adam and Makom. That is a higher level, of course, of respect. That involves kedusha, which is a lot more difficult to attain than to just be nice to another human being. But you can't get there unless you first went through the first level of bin Adam and Chavero. Develop that relationship in a strong way, and that, as Hashem, will help you develop the relationship with Hashem as well.